All right, everybody, uh, welcome again to our 2021-2022 uh, speaker series. This is our, our fifth event of the year. And this year, uh, you know, or this time, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce our very own uh, Justin Tetro. Uh, Justin's an assistant professor of sociology at University of Alberta. All Austin. right, everybody, uh, welcome oh, no, again my, my YouTube to is... our 2021-2022 uh, uh, speaker series. This is our, our fifth oops. event of the year. Sorry about that. My, I started myself playing in the background. I'll try that again. Uh, yeah, so Justin is assistant professor uh, of sociology at University of Alberta's Augustana campus. Uh, he specializes in social movements, race uh, and indigeneity, prisons, qualitative methods, and political theory. He spent four years interviewing on the ground organizers and supporters of Canada's right wing nationalist movement from 2016 to 2020. And many of those participants are now involved in the anti-vax movement, including the Freedom Convoy. He conducted the first, um, or sorry, he conducted the first, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I wrote there, uh, semi-ethnographic semi study of Canada's right-wing nationalist movement. Uh, he's also a senior researcher and project manager, manager of the University of Alberta Prison Project. Um, and I'll turn it over to Justin, but I should say he's also one of the faces of the grad program because your face, Justin, is still on all the promotional material for the grad program here in sociology. So, well, Okay, thanks a lot for the intro, Jeff. Um, afternoon, everyone. I guess I'll share my screen and start by doing that. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I'm currently in Treaty 6 territory in Camrose, Alberta, uh, traditionally known as Stony Creek and home of the Muscogee, Snehiawak, uh, Nitsotsipi, and the Satina, as well as the Métis. So I want to start with what does this talk about? Well, it's about a few things. Part of it is exploring why did the Freedom Convoy have such momentum in Canada and why were so many people maybe surprised about that? So it's about the Freedom Convoy, but it's also about how did we get here? What was happening with Canada's right-wing movement before the Freedom Convoy and the pandemic? So as Jeff mentioned, I spent four years from 2016 to 2020 uh, interviewing on the ground organizers and supporters of Canada's right wing nationalist movement here in Alberta. In other words, uh, I interviewed people who were not just running online pages, but people who showed up in person to rallies and people who organized or led uh, rallies in various cities. And many of the people I interviewed, as previously mentioned, are now heavily involved in the current anti vaccine, anti mandate movement, including the convoy. And so this talk is also about the state of Canada's on the ground right wing movement before COVID-19 and leading up to this transition into COVID conspiracism, anti-vaccine uh, discourse, etc. And so in short, I'm critiquing some popular narratives for how Canadians discuss right wing organizing in their country where there's a couple things going on. First, there's this ongoing narrative that this doesn't happen in Canada. This doesn't happen here. This narrative that the convoy or right wing groups are un-Canadian. And second, there's a narrative that we ought to think of the convoy and right-wing groups as foremost an extremist movement. And so my argument is that this discourse I just mentioned, it's a pattern we've been seeing in Canada since roughly 2015, 2016, where every time we see right-wing organizing and protests in this country, there's this strong urge among media and some experts, uh, politicians, to paint these people as not representing Canada and presenting them as kind of an extremist fringe. Yet the evidence that these groups are somehow un-Canadian or outside the mainstream is not as strong as we think. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that there is no extremism or that we shouldn't take extremism seriously. Rather, my goal is just to complicate how we interpret the convoy and more specifically encourage us to think more carefully or more carefully consider the convoy's relationship to average Canadians and Canadian culture, the convoy's broader appeal. And the language and how we talk about right-wing organizing in this country by fixating on extremism, as I will show you, tends to kind of dismiss the right-wing's potential to grow and have political power. And the last thing here, I am focusing my attention today on Canada, but I do think my findings and arguments about how we think about extremism do apply in the broader discipline, which non-Canadians I think could find useful and might apply to their own context. And so the goal of much of my work is developing better ways to uh, study right-wing social movements and analyze their relationship to the status quo. And uh, that's what I'm doing here. So basically today, this is the structure of my talk. I, I wanna start off with a bit on Canadian exceptionalism using an example, 
Then I'll talk about my study on the Canadian nationalist movement. And lastly, explore, you know, what does my study tell us about the convoy and how people are talking about the convoy? So the first one, uh, Canadian exceptionalism, what does that mean? Well, it's this popular belief that Canada is this exceptional country, you know, exceptionalism, exceptional. We're this exceptional country with a progressive culture that rejects intolerance and conspiratorial thinking and xenophobia, et cetera. It's this kind of fluffy idea that Canada champions acceptance and diversity and rationality, et cetera. And that this also reflects in the people of the country as well. And as I'll show, many well-educated, well-meaning progressive people believe and propagate Canadian exceptionalism at some level. And perhaps ironically, as I will also show, Canada's right-wing nationalist movement also propagates this idea that Canada is this exceptionally tolerant country to the point where some argue that we don't have issues with things like racism or inequality and that sort of thing. So across much of the political spectrum, people put Canada on this progressive pedestal to varying degrees, when the evidence sometimes or often suggests otherwise. So I want to begin by kind of setting the stage for how Canadians like to talk about right-wing organizing, uh, what I think is an easy example of Canadian exceptionalism. And to be clear, these are only articles with Trumpism in the headline. There are dozens more that discuss Trumpism in Canada just in the body text. And so I understand using the word Trumpism in the American context, but what Trumpism means in Canada is poorly, if ever, defined. These articles tell, uh, tend to do a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. In other words, the writers often tell the audience that Trump's influence on Canada is significant, but rarely show how this is the case. And what Trumpism really means in the great majority of these articles is simply right-wing nationalism and populism or racist organizing. So instead of just saying that or discussing Canadian nationalism, they use the phrase Trumpism. And most of these articles are basically saying or heavily implying that Trump and his legacy has inspired right-wing organizing or sentiment in Canada as though it wasn't there before, such as you know, Canadian anti-Muslim protests or more recently inspiring the convoy. And many of these pieces say that Canada is better than this. Canada is better than Trumpism and right-wing intolerance is un-Canadian. You can see some of this language in the headlines. Uh, Canada caught the Trump virus, or that Trumpism is toxic and Canada is going to get infected. Uh, Trumpism is infiltrating Canada. Trumpism is imported. Trumpism has arrived, uh, or it's being brought to Canada. Again, all of this suggesting that right-wing nationalism is somehow separate from Canada or outside of Canada. It's not something coming from within our country. It's something foreign being introduced or imposed upon us good, tolerant Canadians. Another part of this discourse is about whether Canada's good, tolerant culture will prevent so-called Trumpism. So you have Canada is not immune to Trumpism. Canada is vulnerable to Trumpism. Some articles literally describe Canada as the last progressive country on earth that will overcome the Trumpist movement. And to be clear, we should examine Trump's influence on Canadian culture. This is an important question. Uh, my issue is that Trump's influence on our politics is sometimes taken as self-evident or common sense. Many just assume, you know, maybe it's Trump's fault Canada has these right-wing protests. Uh, Trump's influence is something that needs to be studied, and right now the evidence certainly isn't there to support these kinds of grandiose claims that right-wing organizing is foremost because of Trump. So why am I talking about this, Trumpism in Canada? Well, first, it's an easy example of Canadian exceptionalism. The idea that right-wing nationalism and populism, it's Trumpist, it's not Canadian. And second, this narrative has been going on for a long time. Since roughly 2016, when I began my fieldwork, where some would point to Trump as causing the rise of anti-Muslim groups in Canada with little evidence, and years later, we're seeing the same trends kind of pop up for how people are writing about the convoy. And third, the third reason I'm talking about Trumpism is because I would argue this kind of signals a gap in our thinking. Uh, put another way, we don't really know how to talk about right wing in, the right wing in Canada as a social movement or cultural issue. So what writers do sometimes is turn to other countries or popular trends to try to make sense of what's going on, which is understandable. So on to part two, my study from 2016 to 2020. Uh, doing my research, I saw my job as studying Canada's right-wing movement from a cultural studies, social movement studies lens or perspective, because I wanted to understand these groups as a political force and a social movement, you know, what attracts to the, uh, people to these movements. Regarding accessing these groups, I approached them completely cold. Uh, initially, I emailed some groups and was rejected. And so I decided I would just start showing up to 
the rallies on the weekends in Edmonton every weekend and uh, started talking to people, asking who organized it and that sort of thing. And to uh, recruit participants, I basically said, hey, I'm a PhD student. I just wanted to know what it's like to be a conservative activist in you know, the Trudeau era, some kind of phrasing like that. And I started with interviewing groups protesting at the Alberta legislature. And over the course of four years or so, I was able to interview eventually uh, more extreme people, open white nationalists, who I'll talk about in a little bit. And when I started this work, these were primarily anti-Muslim groups. And so you had that Trumpism narrative going on in media, blaming the protests on Trump, these anti-Muslim groups on Trump. But the dominant popular and expert conversation about these protests and rallies centered on extremism. What does extremism mean? Well, there's lots of debate over that, but in this context, in the Canadian context, especially in this period, extremism typically meant white nationalism, extreme racism, as well as the potential for vigilante violence, such as the potential for these groups to commit hate crime or terrorism, so criminal acts. So if you're called an extremist group, that's typically the implication you're supporting in this context, you're supporting white nationalism, and there's a risk that your group might commit criminal violence. And again, this is not me saying that extremism is irrelevant or unimportant, but when you label an entire movement extremist, the implication is that these groups do not represent the status quo. They're on the extremes. They're far right, far right suggesting significant distance from the mainstream right or mainstream conservatism, far. So I was interested in like, what is the relationship to the status quo? How can we begin to think about their connections to mainstream Canadian culture? Again, I'm trying to understand these groups as a political movement, not a terrorist threat. Because throughout my field work and the, do the, the dominant narrative was that these groups are a, a criminogenic white nationalist groups, extremist groups. And I found that I could not do my study without having to directly address and complicate this narrative that dominated Canadian media and research. And so through my study, I identified what I argue is a trend in popular research and discourse on right-wing social movements that goes outside of Canada. And it's what I call uh, security approaches. And so as we go along today, you can kind of think about how the themes I bring up might apply to how people are thinking about the convoy. And at the end, I'll talk about that. So what are our security approaches? Well, it's when we use criminal justice, public safety, and or anti-terrorism logic to analyze right-wing social movements. Uh, these approaches, as I have on the slide here, are often organized around identifying and managing risks to public safety. To put it another way, we're increasingly viewing right-wing social movements through the lens of security, because frankly, we want to protect ourselves from political violence, hate crimes, hate speech. Uh, so a lot of research and discussion today, um, you know, in the modern times is organized around identifying and managing the criminal risks of these groups. And of course, there's lots of good work here in security-oriented research. I don't mean to diminish that or suggest we shouldn't do it. Instead, my argument is that we need to acknowledge the limits of security-oriented to work when we analyze social movements and in short security approaches because they're organized around risk management they tend to center their attention on violence and extreme ideologies such as white nationalism so what i mean by that is that the security researcher will be far more interested in the extreme rhetoric of these groups rather than the more mundane liberal conservative ideas and they'll also be more attuned to violence and crime including hate speech and threats etc and less interested in how these groups work on their public image and mainstream legitimacy. So as I did my study, nearly all discussions about these nationalist groups centered on public safety issues, on the threat of white nationalist extremism. Almost no one was talking about Canadian nationalism. That's a phrase you almost never see. And very few were taking these groups very seriously as a political force that could influence average Canadians or politicians or affect uh, broader conservative discourse. Because the narrative was more or less that this movement doesn't represent Canada. It's a bunch of risky fringe groups that have the potential for criminal violence, which is perhaps why we never see the phrase Canadian nationalism being used, because there's this urge to say these groups, they're not real Canadians. They, they aren't promoting Canadian values. So starting my study, uh, this was my main question. How important are vigilante violence and extreme politics to the Canadian nationalist movement? Put another way, my question was, how big of a role does extremism play in this movement, especially the on the ground component? So what did I find over the course of my four years of interviews and observation? Well, number one, the broader Canadian nationalist movement emphasizes law and order rather than vigilantism or violent extremism. And number two, the broader movement foregrounds liberal ideas rather than extreme racist ideas. 
And to be clear, me saying that they promote liberal ideas uh, is not praising these groups or absolving them of prejudice or something. There is a long history of right-wing and far-right groups using nebulous liberal ideas to advance their interests, which I'll illustrate shortly. And so my argument is what attracts people to the nationalist movement is not the overt hate and extremism that tip that's typically talked about, but the more moderate and mundane right-wing ideas closer to mainstream conservatism. Just as a side note, you might be wondering why there are so many yellow safety jackets in the pictures. Uh, this is because the movement rebranded at the end of 2018 uh, and were inspired by the French Yellow Vest Movement, which was originally a protest against uh, fuel prices and the liberal government in France, and it evolved over the years. So that movement inspired these groups to wear these uh, yellow safety jackets at the protests. So my findings, uh, let's start with number one, the movement emphasizes law and order. So my findings suggest that the nationalist movement's success or growth has far more to do with its legitimate tactics and celebration of law and order rather than its violent extremism. Uh, what media and some experts seem to downplay or neglect is that most right-wing groups are deeply invested in state power or statism. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, Canadian nationalists, they want stronger laws, they want more police, they want more prisons, uh, they also want increased policing and surveillance of marginalized groups such as Muslims and undocumented immigrants or anti-pipeline and climate protesters, they want crackdowns on crime which disproportionately impacts Indigenous peoples. So through my field work, I found that there was this championing of state power and this rejection of vigilante violence in the broader nationalist movement because violent tactics threatened their legitimacy. So for example, the organizers I interviewed, they took pride in the lawfulness of the rallies. They took pride in their city permits for spaces. Rally speakers regularly praised the police and the troops. Supporters sometimes brought Tim Hortons to the rallies and offered it to police. And the police typically, well, yeah, they always rejected that I saw, presumably not to show favoritism. And this excerpt here is from Dylan. Uh, he led a major anti-Muslim group and organized regular rallies in Alberta. And he had a police contact when organizing rallies and other leaders I interviewed also claimed uh, to do this. So he says, uh, we work with the police. We have a good relationship with them. We run our tactics by our police contacts so that we stay within the law. And he proceeds to say, I asked our police friend and I said, listen, how close are we to getting nailed for hate speech? And he's like, oh, not even close because unless you're preaching genocide, you're saying, oh, we should kill them all and this and that. That's the only way you get nailed for hate speech. So the major groups that organized the largest rallies had contacts to make sure that their events were you know, following the regulations. So one more example here, this is from Alex who was a very prominent and controversial figure in the movement. He also maintained the police contact and got permits for rallies. And in this instance, he explains how he wanted to protest a mosque, but his police contact said, that's a bad idea and hovers that line of threats or intimidation. And he explained to me how he talks to law enforcement regularly and that his rallies have a breakdown of what the schedule is, which gets passed on to police. And this sounds maybe exaggerated, but you know, these narratives about discussions with the city were consistent among the big organizers. And so he says on the slide, so the reason we didn't protest that mosque that day was because of recommendations from law enforcement. And he proceeds to say, uh, standing in front of a mosque is really more of a bully tactic. Do Muslims deserve that treatment? Absolutely they do. But he proceeds to say the intimidating mosque uh, does little more than bring negative attention against the whole movement. So the first, with this first finding with Canadian nationalists, they want the state to do more, essentially, they want the state to do more state violence. And this really speaks to something that I think gets overlooked sometimes, which is that this movement, at least when I was studying it, is trying to seek legitimacy. And consequently, vigilante or criminal violence is very often frowned upon and often antithetical to the broader movement's goal of mainstream legitimacy and ultimately delegating violence to the state. This is how these nationalist groups were able to mobilize this narrative of nonviolence. They can maintain legitimacy by claiming, hey, we don't do vigilante or criminal violence, but they can simultaneously call for more state violence, more deportations, stronger military, counterterrorism laws, police crackdowns, etc. And I found uh, the biggest groups to be pretty strict about rejecting vigilanteism. So for example, in Alberta, rallies are often organized by multiple groups, multiple right-wing groups. And Alex's group, who was a major part of it, he was in the previous slide, he did end up, or his group did end up intimidating that mosque. And when they did that, they were immediately barred from the rallies, they were barred from organizing because that was viewed as too aggressive and risked discrediting the broader movement. 
And I went to the rally that weekend just after this happened. And one of the organizers who was friends with Alex and his group said this, you know, I don't know why these guys do stuff like that. We're not here to threaten people. This is a nonviolence movement. That's the job of the police, not us. So again, the, the idea, first of all, that police should be doing more to surveil Muslims. And second, the idea that at the same time, policing is not our job. You know, we patriots, we respect the law and want things to do in a legitimate civil, you know, so-called civilized way. Opposing vigilantism also kind of served as a rhetorical strategy for the movement. So my participants had this narrative that we Canadians are we're moral and generous and civilized. We do things in legitimate in a legitimate way, nonviolent way, mild manner way, like good Canadians. And then they would say, you know, unlike Antifa and BLM and other, you know, leftist protest groups, where they would accuse their opponents of being uh, violent or uncivilized or un-Canadian. And we're seeing this a little bit with the convoy with these tactics where there are disagreements about um, using uh, certain tactics and violence, which we'll talk about in, in a bit. The next uh, uh, finding, my study suggests that what attracts people to right-wing nationalist movements is the liberalism of the movements rather than the extreme or fringe parts, such as neo-Nazism. So the previous part was about the tactics of the movement in relation to violence. Number two here is more about the ideologies or the ideas that dominate the broader movement. And there's a lot of liberal ideas at work here. So what do I mean by liberal ideas? Well, I just talked about one, which is the liberal value of security, celebrating state power, law and order, uh, fetishizing crime control and border control, as though stronger laws and more police and prisons are solutions to society's problems. And I would argue that security narratives are far more powerful than something like neo-Nazism, because security logic has the benefit of being viewed as neutral or natural or common sense, whereas we're more likely to view something like neo-Nazism as ideological or far right. Security discourse is also a way to demonize racialized groups without talking about race. We know what people mean when they demand border control, or if it's about crime, we know which groups are disproportionately going to be targeted. So right-wing activists can call for expanding state power and think of themselves as neutral, you know, non-racist. Uh, they imagine their politics as like common sense. We just want more security, that kind of language. There's also mounting evidence, as I'm sure much of the audience knows, that right-wing nationalist groups are highly attractive to current or ex-military and police and correctional officers, so security-based careers. So in short, I would argue that the liberal value of security is front and center in these types of movements, yet it's not something that's talked about very much. And with the convoy, there are currently investigations into police and military service members supporting the convoy financially or being in the Ottawa occupation. I think CBC claimed to identify uh, 60 Canadian law enforcement members who donated. But back to my study, another liberal value they perhaps ironically mobilize is tolerance. Basically arguing that, hey, it's us Canadians, us patriots, we're the nice and open and tolerant ones. It's actually the left, Antifa, Islam, Black Lives Matter, those are the real intolerant people, those are the real racists or the real hate groups, that kind of language. And LD's statement here epitomizes this kind of thinking where there was this consistent narrative among my participants that Canada was this great and peaceful society and now the leftists and Trudeau and certain cultures such as Islam and so-called gendered ideology are uh, dividing our society and these leftist groups are imposing their political ideologies on people. So again, it's this idea that us patriots or conservatives, we don't have an ideology. We're just speaking truth to power and using common sense and being objective and rational. Those are more liberal themes. This idea that, for example, securing our borders is not an ideology, it's just common sense. And the leftists are imposing their ideologies. And back to tolerance, it's also this idea that we're letting intolerant cultures into the country which is what Eric states here in his comment on the slide, that Muslim immigrants hate Canada and hate what Canadians stand for and hate Canadian tolerance and diversity. This idea like Muslims want everyone to be the same, to be Muslims, Canadians want diversity, alluding to these ideas. This kind of talk is also where participants would bring up kind of liberal human rights talk. So for example, demonizing Islam by saying that Islam works against women's rights and that so-called real feminism is opposing Islam. Uh, some other common liberal themes were emphasizing freedom of expression as a right, which nationalists have been doing for the last hundred years. Another one was the liberal idea of the free press, promoting a free press, but maybe not in the way you think. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising, but nearly all of my participants um, hated mainstream media, thinking the CBC is fake news and that corporations are indoctrinating people with leftist politics. 
So part of their narrative is that news media is corrupted and extremely biased and us patriots who have our common sense, not an ideology, we need to make the press independent and free from bias, especially leftist bias. And finally, with the question of white nationalism or racism, my findings suggest that the broader movement emphasizes this idea of racial colorblindness in the way that Eduardo Bonilla Silva and others have written about it. So for my participants, they believe that Canada should be neutral to race. To put it another way, they think we should accept diversity and differences, but should not promote, uplift, or subsidize any group, like racialized group. So for example, they would oppose all progressive policies that acknowledge racial inequality, such as Motion 103 and 103 to protect Muslims, or policies investing in impoverished indigenous communities, or initiatives addressing anti-Black racism in Canada. For the nationalist movement, they view these types of policies as a kind of favoritism, so favoring one ethnic group over others, which they view as, uh, from their perspective, they view that as racist. They also use this rationale when discussing gender and sexuality, asserting that the government and other institutions should elevate certain lifestyles, like with pride. And these activists would profess that they are for equality, but they think equality is only achievable through neutrality. In other words, government shouldn't do anything. Government should be neutral. We have to treat everyone exactly the same and never acknowledge differences, history, structural inequality, et cetera. Because for them, they think society is already mostly fair, so we don't need more policies to support people who are struggling. So those were the big liberal themes in this movement, and you can think about how this liberal language manifests in the convoy as well. I mean, the word freedom is one, the freedom convoy, mandate freedom was a common slogan. Uh, my body, my choice is another anti-vaccine phrase referring to being vaccinated. You know, I choose for my body not to be vaccinated, saying the unvaccinated are a minority being discriminated against, uh, the rights of the unvaccinated, et cetera. So traditionally liberal ideas being mobilized there as well or at least liberal language. But back to my study and going back to my original research question, how prominent was white nationalism in the movement? It was certainly there. Uh, I interviewed 42 people and of the 42, I would say that roughly 10 were openly white nationalists. And these people were surprisingly candid and basically told me that mobilizing under white nationalism was futile in this country, in Canada. In other words, openly promoting racial superiority or talking about white genocide, uh, was not effective and turned people off. So this quote is from Grant. He was a young guy who uh, joined a prominent men's only nationalist group. And I asked what he thought about a white ethno state. And he basically says it's ridiculous or at least promoting the idea in Canada is ridiculous. And he proceeds to say that if you wanna take that idea somewhere you need to take it somewhere where it already worked at one point, suggesting Canada is not the place to do that. And like the trucker convoy, my findings suggest that the uh, the, the, the convoy, my findings suggest that the organizers were more often extreme than the supporters. So for example, we're back at Dylan here. Uh, Dylan is a white nationalist, but he didn't openly promote white nationalist statements in his group because it turned away potential supporters of his anti-Muslim group, such as moderates, people of color, Jewish people, LGBTQ people, etc. And he coordinated rallies with a conservative Chinese group, as well as a local Nigerian group. And so I asked him you know, how, how he manages extreme views online. And he says, the worst is the hardcore white supremacist Nazi types that are on our Facebook page that just hate Jews. And then there's a lot of pro-Israel people and people from Israel posting Israel stuff. And the Nazis start attacking them. And then he concludes that some of these groups are just too extreme and that's why they never go anywhere. And the organizers, whatever their beliefs were, acknowledged this. You don't go too extreme because that turns people away. You would be considered a novice to the movement if you foregrounded extreme, ide extreme ideas, whether you believed in them or not. One final example of this is with a rally I went to where a bunch of new groups wanted to be involved. I think it was the biggest rally I went to. And one leader of a group went on the microphone in front of a big audience and started making overtly ethno-nationalist and anti-immigrant statements and people in the audience were visibly uncomfortable and some started to leave because it was too extreme. And Benjamin was one of the key organizers here. And he says, yeah, bringing in new groups has been good for us, but it's also a mess. Uh, some of them are great, don't get me wrong, but like some of them don't know what they're doing. So I've had to do a lot more micromanaging and all that, it's a ton of work. And so after this incident, which was also covered by mainstream news, uh, my participants explained how they had to do tighter management of who got to speak and better vetting of which groups they included. And so they barred that one group from their future rallies. Uh, some groups also had an open mic 
at the end of the rally so anyone could go up and speak on the mic. Uh, and the organizers put a stop to that to avoid more extreme people from going up there and potentially uh, jeopardizing their image. So to wrap up this part, you might be saying, OK, well, you've shown me how this movement uses liberal ideas and polices some of the extremism, but aren't they still fringe? How can you say these ideas represent more Canadians than we think? Well, let's start with anti-Muslim sentiment. When I did my study, Islam was the number one issue among these groups, the most prominent grievance easily. And so what do average Canadians think about Muslims? All the data we have, or at least while I was studying this movement, consistently showed that roughly half of Canadians hold anti-Muslim attitudes to some degree. I have listed a bunch of polls and studies here. Uh, so that's one major part. Anti-Muslim sentiment is fairly common in Canada. And in addition to that, I just explained uh, how my participants held these kind of contradictory beliefs and tolerance, where they would say, yeah, we accept people, but certain people or cultures are incompatible with Canada. This arguably was also reflected in existing data and polls of the time. In other words, many Canadians claim to be tolerant and accepting of cultures and think multiculturalism is an okay idea or philosophy, but when asked more specific questions about policy and how we ought to include cultures, like from a policy perspective, Canadians tended to desire the melting pot model or assimilation. As one study shows, 64% of Canadians expressed that multiculturalism brings in cultures that are quote unquote incompatible with Canadian values. Uh, roughly half of Canadians think multiculturalism is good, but when given the choice between multiculturalism or the melting pot, roughly half of Canadians chose the melting pot, so assimilation. Uh, two studies had that similar finding. So what am I getting at here? Well, the white national, or the white nationalist movement, I would argue, or sorry, not the white nationalist movement, the Canadian nationalist movement, I would argue, is much less fringe than we think. Uh, based on my findings, they appear to represent a significant part of the Canadian public that we need to take seriously as a political force and social movement. Uh, they do not exist on the fringes or extremes, and considering their representation in major opinion polls, they are certainly not un-Canadian. So to summarize, moving into the third and final part with the 2022 convoy, what can we take from my study? Well, I've tried to show how Canadian exceptionalism and security-oriented thinking have influenced how we see these groups. In other words, we like to think of them as un-Canadian and foremost extremist or fringe, despite the evidence. And so we can ask ourselves, are these biases also influencing how we perceive the so-called uh, freedom convoy and the related kind of COVID conspiracy movement? I would say yes. Uh, at some level, we're seeing similar trends happen again, where the discussion centers on extremism, and we're a little defensive that these groups, and want to say that these groups don't represent Canada because we're all good uh, progressives over here. So here's some pop narratives I've noticed. Um, and to be clear, this is not a systemic study or discourse analysis here. There simply hasn't been enough time to do a study on this. These are just some things I've been noticing where media and some experts and also politicians are making sweeping generalizations across the whole movement or heavily implying it. And I kind of understand the urge to do this. If you don't agree with the convoy, it's frustrating to see the occupation of the city, maybe the, the questionable police response and the disregard for the pandemic. You know, I understand why people generalize, but these generalizations seem to come more from this urge to morally condemn the convoy and defend Canada's reputation rather than being based in any kind of strong evidence. And these generalizations don't, I think, get us far in understanding what's happening. But let's go through these quick. The movement is anti-government or anti-status, meaning that essentially the movement wants to overthrow the government. Some experts, media and politicians have said this, uh, and we do have evidence that some people want a violent revolution of sorts, saying, you know, we want a kind of January 6th siege, just like the US. But I'm highly skeptical that most or even many convoy supporters want to violently overthrow the government. Uh, opposing mandates or the Trudeau and the liberals is not the same thing as wanting a violent revolution. Uh, moreover, uh, if we're Assuming most of these people are conservatives or uh, right-wingers, the words anti-government or anti-statist can never apply to people who want stronger borders, tough on crime, an ethno-state, a theocracy, etc. Are there sovereign citizen type of people in the movement? Absolutely. Uh, do they represent the whole movement? No. Uh, 
the evidence is not there. As I hope I've illustrated, it takes research to assess how prominent certain beliefs are within a social movement. We can speculate, of course, but we can't make such grand conclusions uh, in advance, or at least sweeping generalizations. Uh, generalizing the movement's ideology as anti-government also reproduces this idea that the movement is extremist, is an extremist movement, the convoy, this idea like the, the convoy wants to overthrow the government. So clearly they don't represent average Canadians or normal conservatism. Uh, next, swastika guy represents the movement, the movement is all right. As I'm sure the audience knows, there were multiple instances of, of men waving swastikas during the occupation. And while this is alarming, uh, it doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. We knew off the bat that organizers of the convoy held pretty extreme views. And here we see some of that reflected in the audience. Does the presence of a swastika mean the entire convoy is now a neo-Nazi or white nationalist rally? Well, I don't think that's a helpful analysis if we want to understand this movement as a cultural or political issue. Uh, yet we've seen some media and experts label the entire convoy alt-right, white nationalist, far right, et cetera. The convoy is Trumpism or foreign influence. I talked about Trumpism already, but regarding the second point about foreign influence, it is true, it seems, that there has been foreign money injected into the convoy, uh, likely extending the occupation's longevity. Does that mean this movement is a foreign insurgency? Uh, no, uh, we do not have near enough evidence to suggest this. This argument uh, partially stems, I think, from Canadian exceptionalism, this idea that there's no way that us good Canadians could sustain or widely support such an awful movement. So it must be foreign money or Trump's legacy or both. Uh, once again, considering outside influence is an important question. I'm not dismissing it, but they need to be, these questions need to be researched. Right now, the evidence supports much more strongly that this is a Canadian movement organized and sustained by Canadians. And finally, the most concerning one, in my opinion, is the convoy occupiers are criminals or terrorists. Uh, some have argued this, and I don't specialize in terrorism law, but suggesting that the convoy's protest tactics, such as delaying traffic, occupying a space, disturbing the peace, ought to be considered terrorism, uh, I think that gets into dangerous territory. Because if we start introducing new terrorism laws, we know that counterterrorism efforts disproportionately apply to progressive movements, uh, marginalized groups. Also, many have compared the light police response to the convoy uh, to the much harsher police response to, say, climate protesters, anti-Muslim groups, indigenous peoples. And that's a good conversation to have. Uh, but the response to that shouldn't then be the convoy protesters are terrorists or we ought to think of them as that and inflate the police state. Were there convoy protesters who committed crimes during the occupation? Uh, absolutely. But again, there's this urge by many to generalize a single feature or happening across a social movement. And this narrative, I think, partly stems from this trend I've identified in Canada, uh, where we've relied uh, on security-centric thinking for so long that our instinct is to look at the convoy foremost as a crime problem or public safety issue rather than a broader cultural issue. And to be clear, we can do both at the same time, but we've tended to fixate more on security. So in sum, with these four trends, the convoy does have a bit of all of these. There's some anti-statism, there's some white nationalism, there is some foreign involvement or outside influence. Trump probably matters at some level, and there's some criminality. The big question is, can we consider this a fringe movement? A better question, though, is, is it helpful to label this a fringe movement? What is it doing when we do that? Are we calling it a fringe movement because we want to morally condemn it? or defend Canada's reputation because it makes us feel comfortable? Or are we calling it a fringe movement because the evidence is there? The evidence, I would argue, is not there. Current research shows that roughly 30% of Canadians are supportive or at least sympathetic to the convoy's grievances. One poll that I'm sure many of you saw showed that 46% of Canadians sympathize with the convoy but disagree with the tactics used. Another found 44% agree with the ideas but not the tactics of the convoy. Another found that 37% of Canadians agree with the convoy's ideas, but wouldn't state so publicly. This might not be the majority of Canadians, of course, but even if it's 30% or slightly less than that, that's still a quarter of the country who are supportive to a degree of a political issue. We also have politicians like current conservative front runner, Pierre Poilievre, expressing his support for the convoy, 
And it's not clear yet whether that will be a kind of make or break moment for him, but nonetheless, mainstream politicians who have a shot at prime minister are in this conversation, meaning that this is a social movement that we need to take seriously. As a side note, I've also noticed probably of uh, using the language of my participants that liberals or progressives are dividing Canada, dividing Canadians, playing into this idea again, that we conservatives are the tolerant common sense ones and progressives are creating chaos and imposing their ideologies on people to divide the country. Once again, showing some overlap between uh, my study and the convoy. To wrap up, uh, my goal here was to get us thinking more critically about the right wing movement's relationship to mainstream culture, and this involves carefully assessing the evidence rather than relying on maybe myths about Canada and overcoming this urge to view these groups as fringe or extremists. Uh, how we talk about these groups affects how we understand them and how we respond to them, and the goal of my study uh, was to understand these groups as a political force rather than a crime problem or security issue. And so ideally, I hope uh, my work can kind of serve as a starting point for researchers who are interested in studying the popular appeal of right-wing social movements, including uh, the convoy and the broader COVID conspiracy movement in Canada and abroad. So uh, I will leave it at that. And uh, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. All right. Thanks so much, Justin. And, and I guess just while we uh, let Justin catch his breath for a second, um, I just want to tell everybody that you know it, it hasn't been announced by email yet, but it'll be coming out next week and we'll be putting it up on our website. Um, on March 31st and April 1st, we are hosting our second annual conference. Uh, last year's theme was prisons and punishment. This week we are doing uh, policing. And uh, our first session will be um, at 8 a.m. on the 31st. And we have uh, Dr. Tracy Miras from Yale Law School. Um, and she's giving a talk uh, for the keynotes, re-examining the state's police power, safety deprivation, and the meaning of citizenship. So it's a, a huge name and a, and a big get for us. And we're really excited about it. The schedule for the whole thing will be up on uh, our website, canadiancriminology.com, early next week, uh, as soon as I'm able to get to it. Uh, and then uh, we'll have announcements going out on social media. I think it's already up on our Twitter and Instagram. Um, so keep an eye there. And all the sessions uh, you know, will be published on our website and we'll have social media blitz going. All right. Anybody who has questions for Justin, do feel free. Um, I, let's start with, uh, I guess we'll start with Zori. Hi, um, Justin, thank you for your uh, talk. Really interesting. Um, my question is, um, what do we gain by arguing that potentially the groups that we think are fringe uh, might actually be a lot more mainstream. Isn't this what these groups themselves would want to say? That, you know, wouldn't they love to bring somebody to give a talk that shows that they are actually quite mainstream and they are not fringe at all and that they have the support of 30 to 40% of the population? in one way or another, or at least they're in some sort of um, uh, continuity with um, 30, 40, 50% of the population. Um, so yeah, what do we have to gain by saying this? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, my response to that would be is like the information is already there um, and politicians are already capitalizing on it. Um, you know, Pierre Polyev is clearly aware that this group has um, likely will support the you know, conservative leadership and um, potentially his role in that. So I don't think, uh, I don't want to say it doesn't make a difference. I mean, we can never really know uh, how discourse affects um, things, but uh, frankly, dismissing these groups as extremists, as we, I think, have kind of been doing for the last five, six, however many years, uh, I don't think has really been, I don't know what working means, but um, 
I don't think we've been taking it seriously as a cultural issue. And the issue with presenting them as extremists is that we tend to reduce these groups to, okay, this is a public safety issue. Uh, we don't need to think, we don't need to interrogate how our own Canadian values might overlap with some of theirs and question what we do believe ourselves or think about maybe we should be teaching things differently in public schools. Um, instead, the urge is to, uh, these are all fringe group extremists and, you know, just, uh, I don't want to say ignore them, but like, you know, uh, police, that we need more police, we need more surveillance. Um, and I think uh, thinking of them as a, you know, we have to acknowledge the reality, I think, if we want to address this issue. I mean, I understand if people might disagree with that, um, but to say that they represent part of the population is not praise. Uh, that's not a, what I'm saying that you're saying, but it's not praise. It's just um, acknowledging the reality that conservative politicians can and will capitalize on and uh, affect potentially policy. So, um, I'm not sure if other people might agree with that, but um, I think what we've been doing has not really been working and clearly the conservative movement or right-wing movement is not growing smaller or going away. So do we keep doing what we're doing and saying these are extremist fringe groups or do we change our strategy? Um, and I don't think there's, I'm not, you know, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's something worth um, discussing, but it's a, it's a really good question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Will, why don't you, uh, you go ahead. Uh, brilliant talk as always, Justin. I always enjoy listening to kind of your insight on this stuff. I think it's really good. Um, one thing I'm going to not push back. I just want to kind of hear what you, how you respond to this. Uh, you, you make, and I think accurately, a, a point that this isn't just Trumpism North, so to speak. This is a Canadian, there are specific and very uniquely Canadian aspects to this theme. However, I think one of the things that's very unique about the trucker protests that we've seen is the very explicit and um, use of American symbolism in the protests. So I'm talking about Trump flags everywhere, MAGA hats. Uh, even today, I was reading a CBC story from the Coots protests where people were describing themselves as Northern Montanans rather than Albertans. So you, you say that they are Canadian themes, yet at the same time, people are explicitly drawing on a very explicit American symbolism and American legal codes and are expressing surprise when their First Amendment rights are violated. Why, how does this play into it? And how perhaps to, is there, what are the national cultural imaginaries? How does this play around if, if you get what I'm asking there? Yeah, so I guess I'll kind of explain what I found. I didn't really talk about this in the talk I wanted to, but there just wasn't enough time about, so what did my participants say about Trump? And so to be clear, I, yeah, I don't want to suggest that Trump is irrelevant or not, not even that he's not important, because I do think he's an important figure. Even I uh, use the phrase fake news, and that's, a, you know, a, you could say a Trumpist expression. Uh, my participants uh, use that phrase all the time, and they were definitely influenced by Trump in that regard. Um, but uh, the bigger, so there's an, so with, with my study, there's definitely an influence of American culture, um, but they typically didn't talk about Trump unless I brought him up. Um, and also they were focused on local issues. Um, they were focused on local politics, Alberta politics, Alberta politicians. Um, this was in Alberta. So this is, they were immensely interested in the resource economy with oil. Um, that's also part of it. Uh, so, to be frank, like these are uh, nationalists. And if you're talking to nationalists, they typically privilege the understanding their own country, uh, putting their own country ahead of other countries. And that's what I found here. Um, so I don't, the trucker convoy is not, uh, the freedom convoy, whatever you want to call it, is not the same thing as the movement I studied. But um, so I don't want to suggest that what I found in my study is exactly the case that you would find in the trucker in the freedom convoy. Um, but uh, that is what I, I, I can, I don't want to speculate too much about, um, you know, uh, US influence, but that's what I found in my study. Um, there's, they think of things and they consume a lot of American media and they use that, as you mentioned, to interpret Canadian law even. Um, and uh, I think that's as much as we know right now, but no, it's a good question. Thank you for answering it and uh, your remarkable restraint for not uh, wildly speculating when given the opportunity to do so. So thank you. Joe, go ahead. Oh, um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it's very insightful. Uh, I do have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, 
what you have said, a, a, a social and political movement perspective. So in, in the literature of social movement, a lot of your analysis uh, actually serve a larger uh, purpose or agenda. That agenda is how, uh, what is the potential or constraint of uh, a social movement, whether it will get larger or have larger impact in the future. And that is usually the question in, in the social movement literature, right? That's why they ask about, for example, how, uh, as you said, how they frame their ideology, how they recruit people, what are the resources, what are the so-called political opportunity structures and that sort of things. So uh, from your own data, from your own analysis, what do you think? What is your estimation? Will, will we get a larger movement of that kind in the future? Or maybe would we get another Trump or even Hitler in, the, in Canada in the next 10 years? So uh, this is one question. Uh, the second one is about gender, because um, I don't know if you have seen something like this in your own observation, but uh, in the U.S., quite a lot, uh, quite a number of people have observed the, the kind of toxic, uh, high masculinity within the white wing group, especially the far right group. And then, even in my own research project back in Hong Kong, I studied some uh, far right group back, uh, groups back in Hong Kong, and they make very sexist jokes even uh, um, in front of their female members. And the female members I, I talked to were very uneasy with this kind of things. So have you seen this kind of gender dynamics and, and, and masculinity and that sort of things in your own uh, observation? Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, those are both really good questions. So I'll start with your first one. I, I feel like you're asking about like social movement success and that sort of thing. Um, so with, with social movement research, it's really hard to assess, uh, first of all, how movements determine successes and failures. And um, all I can really say with my study is that they viewed their successes as numbers. And you did have um, the more extreme groups, the more extreme groups were a little more insular. So when you get to like the far right white nationalist types, um, they were kind of like, we don't care how big our numbers are. Um, I just so so some people would just leave propaganda in public places or just talk to people on the street and try to convert them or leave like their their business card to their white nationalist website in places. They were more insular and secretive and weren't really interested in bringing numbers to their events because um, you know they they couldn't and uh, they just had a different attitude toward what success looked like. And they frankly, as I mentioned, uh, thought that white nationalism could not succeed in Canada. Uh, with the bigger movement, they they really worked on tailoring their messages, as you kind of outlined, uh, framing their messages in a way that brought the biggest audiences, even if they believe things that were a little more extreme, um, the, lead, the leadership, I should say. So um, I, I don't know if I can speculate about, uh, because of the pandemic, I, it's really hard to speculate about the future because the right is organized now around the anti-mandate, anti-vaccine stuff. And I don't know what the next topic for these movements is going to be five years from now, or even a year or two from now. Um, will we see growth in this country of a right-wing movement? Um, it's really hard to say. As I mentioned, Pierre Polyev and, and conservative politicians, prominent conservative politicians are mobilizing a lot of the language that I saw. So I do think um, it's concerning. But uh, again, I, I don't want to say that we're going to get the Canadian Trump or whatever language you want to use in, in five years from now. Um, regarding the gender question, uh, you know, hypermasculinity has always kind of been a part of uh, right-wing organizing, especially, I mean, there's lots of people have found this, especially on the far right fringes. Uh, women did have a role, like I use an excerpt from a woman, women did have a role in the movement and they uh, helped organize and that sort of thing, but they to my knowledge, weren't very prominent leaders, but I know a woman or helped organize the trucker convoy. Uh, so um, again, it, I know it's not a satisfying answer, but it's kind of nuanced. Um, they still have very traditional gender views of gender roles, but that shouldn't be particularly surprising considering these are a conservative movement. So um, yeah, that might not be the most satisfying answer, but I guess with the masculinity stuff, like you did see a lot of 
um, how can I phrase this competition? Like my group is bigger than yours. I got hundred people at my rally where your group only got 80 people or 50 people at your rally. So there's a lot of masculine posturing among the leadership and the, there was a lot of infighting, which I didn't have time to emphasize, but there was a lot of infighting. And I think it has a lot to do with kind of masculine kind of posturing about whose protest is bigger, who could get the biggest supporters, et cetera. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you though. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Okay, I've got a couple of uh, YouTube questions here, and then we'll we'll go to Kevin, and that'll probably take us to our, our time here. All right, the first one from Catherine Hancock. Um, super interesting and important talk. Could generalizations about fringe movements be employed to appeal to higher values of moderates, i.e. to highlight their similarities with liberal views? Uh, how do you think these discussions can be had more effectively between persons of opposing views? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So uh, if I could rephrase it, I think you're asking me if we are seeing some overlap between what we typically think is fringe and also the mainstream with tolerance and that sort of thing. So um, if that's the case, like that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the point I'm making is that uh, we need to seriously interrogate, um, you know, some of the very prominent ideas we hold about uh, security and crime control. And um, we need to think beyond this idea of tolerance, um, that it's maybe a little simplistic and uh, maybe um, think through what we mean by a lot of these words, because the right is mobilizing a lot of these nebulous liberal ideas like rights uh, to make the arguments and attract people to their groups. Rights is a discourse that everyone is familiar with. It's a feel good discourse. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about rights or anything like that, but it's um, acknowledging that there is overlap here and uh, we need to take, you know, we look, look investigate that overlap. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure exactly if that answers your question, but um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Sorry. Okay, it'll be a little bit delay before before they hear the answer. Okay, so I've got one more from Carolyn Green here, then we'll go to Kevin. Um, Carolyn says, great talk, fascinating work. Do you have any thoughts on why these groups have chosen to become more visible in recent years? Have challenges to Canada's system of white supremacy triggered this? Uh, why the groups have become more prominent? Um, I mean, the election of Trudeau is a, for, so again, I'm speaking to my data, uh, the election of Trudeau in this country mobilized a lot of my participants. So some participants told me like, I didn't ever think I needed to go outside and protest my whole life. And then Trudeau got elected and suddenly I felt the urge to do so. And, you know, you can definitely point to Trump as like a uh, influence as well. Um, between the election of Trudeau and the election of Trump is around roughly the same period. I think that inspired a lot of these people to, um, you know, organize. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of studies or data showing how much Trump has influenced it, but I think he did a little bit for sure. Um, but again, these people were more interested in Canadian issues. Uh, this was also, again, my study was in Alberta and during that period, um, there was lots of uh, talk about the resource economy, and um, that was another driving force between Trudeau wanting to implement green, green energy, green policies, and many of these people work in oil and feel that their livelihoods are threatened. So that was another mobilizing force, at least in Alberta. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's really the, the election of Trudeau, the anti-green stuff, um, and of course, Islam being another issue uh, with ISIS was very prominent around that time and the right mobilizing the narrative, you know, anti-Muslim narratives and media, uh, et cetera. All of, the, again, this is like multiple things. Again, we can't really just point to any one thing and every protester is a little different, um, but I think that's, those are the main kind of reasons. Thank you for your, uh, your question though. All right, and, and Kevin, uh, take us home here. Sure, uh, thanks, Justin, as always, that was, that was great. Um, I guess two uh, social media, not excuse me, not social media, social movement type of questions. The first is, you know, for the people that you talk to or that we're seeing now, to what extent or is, the, or is there a useful distinction between single cause activists, for, you know, that they're per focused on one thing, or is it just a procession of grievances that people align themselves with? I just got the feeling that the same people 
were coming out to the anti-Muslim stuff and then the same people to the yellow vest, and I suspect it's the same people. So I guess that's the first question, the, the single movement versus the, the, the fluidity from movement to movement. And I guess the second question is, is, is there just, what you're describing here is just an inherent temptation by both journalists and academics to focus on the extremes in an informational economy where that brings attention and then we generalize to the non-extremes. So is there, is there something inherent in both journalism and academics that, that sort of leads to this kind of, you know, generalizing from the extremes to the less extreme, I guess? Yeah, I mean, those are both great questions. So I'll start with uh, the first part, obviously. Uh, this regarding like single issue or multi-issue, one really hard part about doing this study was that it was super messy. Uh, everyone had a hundred different grievances that they listed. And, you know, it, it was always, Islam was almost always one of them. The green energy stuff was almost one of them, almost always one of them. Uh, gender stuff was in there. It was really a hodgepodge of uh, issues that um, also like the movement's demands were kind of vague. Uh, maybe that's unsurprising. Um, they managed to be a little more clear as they went along towards the peak, but right before the pandemic, talking about actual policy and politicians. Um, but early on, I mean, it was, it was, you know, if you have a right wing grievance, of whatever kind, you know, you would fit in here somewhere. Uh, and so it was really hard. So in a, put another way, it's really hard to generalize a single grievance or ideology even across the movement other, other than just calling them like right wing and nationalist. I think those are the most accurate, um, you know, labels. And then you have like uh, sprinklings of uh, uh, far right, white nationalism, uh, anti-gender stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a very, as you, as you phrase it, it's a very fluid movement and uh, it's very messy and contradictory. That's why I would say phrases like anti-government movement or something like that, it, you know, you can't, uh, you can't generalize much across these entire groups. Uh, I, you know, some exceptions though, like anti-Muslim, I think is fair because these, that was the you know, a primary grievance for them. Um, regarding your second question, the, the information culture, uh, yes, is my short answer to that. I do think, um, so for example, I could have called my talk the hate and extremism of the trucker convoy, you know, and I feel like it would have got more attention. Um, you know, people, certain words uh, attract a lot of attention and, you um, you know, it's talking about nuance is, uh, you know, kind of boring. And I do think the Trumpism, this goes with the Trumpism language too. As soon as you say Trumpism, people know what you mean. Um, even though it doesn't really tell us much, the people, it's, it has that familiarity. You also say, oh, Canada's at risk of Trumpism. I, you know, people can look at that and know exactly what you mean by that. Uh, oh yeah, because Canada's so great and tolerant and Trumpism is, you know, the bad right-wingers and here they come for Canada. Uh, it has that familiarity. It has kind of a sensationalism to it. And uh, as you mentioned, talking about extremes is nice and, you know, it, not nice, but like it, uh, it draws people's attention immediately. Um, you know, calling my talk something about social movements and the nuances of the convoy, uh, you know, is not, uh, you know, won't get as much attention. And so I do think that sometimes um, people play into those narratives uh, because it's what people want to hear also. It's comforting to think of these groups as fringe or extremists. I do think people find comfort in that. And uh, my whole point uh, is that it shouldn't be comforting. Uh, this should be a serious discussion about a cultural issue. Um, and if that means, you know, we have to acknowledge that reality, uh, then I don't know, that's, that's, that's my perspective on it. Thank but, you. Uh, thank you for your questions. All right, thank you so much, Justin. Uh, that I guess is, is time. Uh, so we will end it there. Uh, for those of you in the Zoom, if you want to stick around and chat with Justin as, as he has time, uh, don't feel forced, Justin, just stick around for as long as you can. Um, and uh, other than that, yeah, we will see all of you back on the 31st of March again for our, our keynote with Tracy Miras from Yale Law at 8 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. All 